Aloha, this is Professor Wes Porter. This is Introduction to Mock Trial Program. This is part seven of a 10 part series, and this is Objections for Mock Trial. As always, uh, follow our channel, subscribe to our channel, follow us, uh, follow the uh, hashtags, and if you have any video requests or questions, uh, feel free to reach out on Gmail. Now, it's important to think about why is it that the objection, why is it portrayed in TV and the movies, why is it such uh, an event when we talk about real trial and, of course, mock trial? It's because in one snapshot, kind of all players are involved. It's an activity during trial when there's an objection that the person asking the questions has to break from asking their questions. The witness who is answering the questions has to stop from answering their questions. The focus, the jury's focus, the listener's focus shifts from the person who is asking questions and the witness who is answering questions to now to this third party on the outside, this opponent on the outside lodging an objection. And now we've engaged the judge too. The judge must rule on the objections once once raised. So it goes from an activity that we're familiar with, question and answer, one that we talked about, to this sort of uh, uh, abrupt interjection, this objection to the proceedings that then involves everyone wakes up uh, all, all, all parties. So that's why it's a big deal. That's why it draws attention. I'm going to encourage you to think about objections in a different way. You see the image here, it's kind of a hair blown back. Somebody stands up and scream. We think about the drama that is TV and the movies. Objection, hearsay, objection, that's unfair, objection this. And there's all this emotion and, and, and thrust uh, assigned to the objection. And I'm gonna encourage you to think about it the other way. Again, if we think about our earlier videos and professional presentations and how we wanna be portrayed on a camera zoning in just on us, uh, where doing our job just like the question is doing their job and our job if we're sitting there as the opponent beginning with O, the one that's going to object also beginning with O. if we're the opponent we're not the one asking questions but we're the one sort of charged with uh, objecting if something's inappropriate or if it calls for an answer that's inappropriate we should do so as a professional we should stand up in a loud clear articulate way and say objection and then offer the basis for that objection. And we'll talk about the different bases soon. Um, but think about it. We don't wanna ring the bell and get too excited or get too over the top with how we layer on the drama of the objection basis, because if the court were to not agree or see where that was going and say overruled, then you've just made a big deal about something and you got no relief. Um, and so we wanna be very careful about the manner by which we object. Now let's talk about a little bit about how we organize that in the American justice system. So here you see a typical courtroom scene, um, two attorneys standing up, judge facing uh, the, the two attorneys, court reporter, other people in the room. Doesn't really matter, civil trial, criminal trial, it doesn't really matter um, who's the one that's on. Just know that anyone in the courtroom offense and defense, the plaintiff in a civil case, the defendant, the prosecution in a criminal case, or the criminal defense team, anyone could be on for questioning at that moment. If you are the one presenting the questions, if you are the one putting on evidence of uh, asking questions of a witness, you are the proponent, okay, the proponent. So what the proponent's doing here, let's say, is asking questions of their witness that they called. So it's direct examination, asking those who, what, where, when, why, how, describe, explain type questions, open-ended questions, getting answers. Where were you at 10 p.m. on Tuesday, July 17th? That's what the proponent is doing. They might be making a jury address, whether it's an opening statement or a closing argument, but during trial, the proponent is putting on questions to a witness, presenting evidence, putting on evidence proponent. Um, so they're doing so here. Now think about it. If there's something inappropriate, if there's an answer to come from the witness or the question itself calls for something inappropriate, it is the opponent, the one objecting, the other side of the case who's charged with uh, raising an objection and stating the basis for the court. So while the court can do some things on their own, that's called acting sua sponte, the court can act sua sponte, you should operate as, as an attorney or in mock trial as a participant playing an attorney as if the, the judge is silent on this issue. The judge is not going to do your work for you. They are charged with deciding objections before them, not raising objections. So if you're the opponent, let's just say this gentleman on the left, 
you're charged with objection and then offering a basis. And I joke a little bit with objection outrageous because we see this type of objection uh, in TV and the movies that you just say, ah, I don't really like what's happening. Oh, this is unfair to my side. This seems really bad for me. Those are not objections. And we're going to talk about the type of objections you can make. And we're going to talk about how you'd respond to objections as the proponent. But think about this orientation. The one who's asking questions, the one who's presenting evidence, the one who's putting on uh, evidence at that time where the focus is on them, they're the proponent. And any side can be the proponent. And it doesn't matter whether you're in direct and cross. Who's standing up and who's engaged in the activity of asking questions? The other side is charged with getting in the way of that. If there's something inappropriate, the other side is the one who must stand up and say objection and state an actual basis, uh, not just saying the word outrageous. We leave it in the American justice system to the lawyers, the opponent of what's going on to raise an objection. Now the court might ask the proponent's response to this objection and eventually will rule and then they'll move back on to the questioning. Overruled means the proponent gets to go right back to the question they asked before. Sustained means you cannot ask that question and this witness cannot give this answer. Move on to another question. Either way, we're seamlessly moving on in the presentation of direct examination. So keep that in mind. Proponent, the one putting on evidence, presenting evidence. Opponent, the one charged with objecting or opposing uh, the proponent's uh, evidence. So now we're going to talk about the two different types, two different classifications of objections. There's many, many objections. There's a lots of things that could be said when an opponent stands up at trial and says objection and then has to state the basis. We're going to talk about two classifications that I want you to know about. Uh, one will be handled in this video and the other will be handled in a whole separate part. Uh, the first one is evidentiary objections. We're going to take this up in a different video, but I just want you to think there are rules of evidence for every court. So the federal rules for the federal courts, there are state rules for state courts, there's military rules of evidence for military courts, so on and so forth. And it's a whole book of rules as to what is proper or what is improper uh, to be put before a jury for various policy reasons. So they would determine, here's a definition of something, this is hearsay under 801C under the federal rules. Um, and if something meets this, the opponent is charged with objecting as in offering an evidentiary objection, objection hearsay. That means they're saying this violates something in Article 8 of the federal rules. If I say objection irrelevant, I'm saying that violates Rule 401 and 402 of the federal rules. If I say objection, this is improper character, violates other rules within Article 4. Objection, um, this is an uh, impermissible impeachment or improper impeachment under Article 6. So those articles of the rules of evidence have evidentiary objections that go along with them. It's a whole evidence course. It's a whole four credit course. We can't cover it exhaustively, but I can give you what you need to know in a different part to survive in mock trial. The one we're going to talk about here today is the other classification. It's easier. It's the easier one to understand. They're what's called form objections. And really what we're saying when we stand up as the opponent and say objection brackets, I have a form objection. I have a problem. We're saying we have a problem with the way this question is being asked. We have a problem with the answer that may come from a question that is formed this way. Um, so really what we're saying is we're trying to protect the jury from getting inaccurate stuff or to protect the jury from being confused more broadly. So what I want to do is if there's a is if there's a question that I don't think is just getting the witness's answer out cleanly for my jury's ears, there's a problem with the form of that question and there's a problem with the information that comes in the answer, I might object in one of these classifications of form objection. Let's talk about a few of them. So I want you to think of form objections and every evidentiary objections as the opponent puts up hurdles to a question or a piece of evidence coming in. So you can put up as the opponent, you can put up several hurdles at the same time. Maybe the proponent, like our like our image a couple slides ago, was asking a question and I say stand up as the opponent because I think there's something problematic with it. And maybe I say objection. This is leading, it's compound, and it calls for hearsay. I, I've put up three hurdles. I said I have three objections to it. Leading compound and hearsay. 
two of them, the first two, as we'll talk about, are form objections. I got a problem with the form of the question uh, that you that you pose to this witness. It's leading. You're giving them the answer as the questioner rather than getting the answer from the witness. Compound just means I'm asking kind of two questions in one. So when I get a yes, I don't know whether that yes applies to both equally or just to one part of it. And hearsay, like we talked about, is governed by an article of the Federal Rules of Evidence and other rules of evidence in states. And it says it violates the definition of that rule. It says the rules say that that uh, information that meets that definition should be out and improper. So as the opponent, notice I have constructed three hurdles that the proponent has to get through and answer to to be able to get back and ask their question. So a good proponent will act as a professional, disengage with their right hand from the question and answers they're asking of this witness, turn to the judge, only give a left ear hole to the person objecting and say, I have a response. Now, maybe that response is in front of the jury and it's fine, or maybe it's at a sidebar where it's outside the ears of the jury, but they would respond and say, this isn't leading because, this is not compound because, and this is not inadmissible hearsay under Article 8 of the federal rules because. And assuming that they can get over those hurdles, the court will respond, the judge will respond and say, overruled as to all three objection. I get to return to my question seamlessly and repeat it and get back on track. So think about objections are just hurdles. Now the opponent can put up a hurdle to every single question and it can put up three hurdles uh, to any individual question and you have to answer to all. Here are some of the form objections. I want to offer you a, a top five of form objections that you can use or should use in mock trial and, and also the, the, the five as the proponent um, that you should be aware that could be coming by way of form objections. I'll teach you how to cure it and figure it out and handle the objection later. But these are just let's just talk about a top five that we can think about. Uh, people can have different lists. This is my top five are the ones that I think you'll hear the most, not only for, for trial, but for uh, certainly in mock trial. Uh, a lot of them you've heard before from TV and the movies, but more importantly, uh, let's let's talk about what they are, what it sounds like. Um, and then again, in a, in a future slide, I'll, t I'll tell you how to handle it. So objection leading is a very simple thing, it gets uh, twisted a lot, but uh, is the answer, is the content, is the information to be conveyed to the jury on direct examination when I am the proponent and I have my own witness on direct examina examination asking who, what, where, when, why, describe and explain questions questions, uh, you have to have the witness provide the answer in most circumstances, not the attorney asking the questions. So objection leading is when you as the attorney are leading that witness. You are furnishing the information. Uh, you went to State University. Yes. Where did the information come from? It came from my question, not the answer. Instead, it should be, where did you go to college? Answer, State University. Um, you live on Smith Street. Yes. Well, where did the information come from? It came from uh, the questioner again. It should be, where do you live? Smith Street, the information comes. So if it's on direct examination, some in some most contexts, leading is not permitted. Uh, and you can say objection. I object to the form of that question because the, the information is coming from the attorney and not the witness where it belongs on direct. Uh, objection compound. This is a simple one, but uh, it can be confusing. We're trying to prevent uh, confusing information. That's why we might object. If I'm asking two questions in one, what time did you wake up and what did you do first? Well, what is the witness to do with that? They might answer both, but they might answer half. So as the opponent, as the one charged with objecting to information as it comes out, we're entitled to have one question, one answer, one question, one answer. And if the proponent starts smuggling in two questions for the price of one, we get to say objection compound and make them break it down so we're on notice. Uh, asked and answered is, I think, one of the form objections that's confused the most. Here's the rule. Um, with one attorney with the same witness with the same uh, in the same examination they can't ask and answer questions again so if at the beginning of my direct examination over with officer jones i say what time did you arrive at the scene he says 7 30. then later on after i cover some other things i go officer jones what time again did you arrive at the scene uh, the other side the, op the opponent can stand up and object and say this question has been asked by this attorney in this examination of this witness and it's been answered he said 7 30 before uh the judge should sustain that objection because it's been asked and answered in the same examination the place where it goes wrong is 
I sit down, I've asked my, all my questions on direct examination. I've asked the, what time did you arrive at the scene? And I've gotten the 730 answer. And now my opponent is on cross-examination. My opponent who was doing the objecting before is now the proponent. They're asking cross-examination questions. They're the one on the stage. And they try to ask the same question that I asked. Well, in cross-examination, you're entitled to do that. You can ask the very same questions if you want to. They can say you got to, and they would do so with cross-examination, leading style question, because leading is permitted on cross-examination. And they'd say, you got to the scene at 7.30, didn't you? Well, the other attorney can't say objection. I asked, and this witness answered this question, so you can't ask it again. So objection, asked and answered, same attorney, same examination with the same witness. Uh, same thing happens when you call a subsequent witness later on. Now, instead of Officer Jones, uh, I call Officer Steele. And I say, Officer Steele, what time did you all in the same car, you and Mr. Jones, get to the, uh, Detective Jones, get to the scene? 7.30. That can't be asked and answered. It's a different witness. It's a different uh, different question. So asked and answered only applies to same witness, same examination with the same attorney, uh, not from direct to cross or from cross to redirect. Uh, objection assumes facts is a, is a really good one. Uh, and it's really shorthand for objection assumes facts, not in evidence. I can't ask a question uh, of which uh, is loaded question that, that I'm assuming something took place after the murder. Uh, who did you talk to first? Well, by the way, I've asked that question. Uh, I'm assuming that this witness knows about the murder. And I'm also assuming that they talk to people because I said, who did you talk to first? So you're not allowed to assume facts. I would have to establish in a line of questions to say, uh, did you know about the murder? Yes. Did you have conversations after the murder? Yes. After the murder, who did you talk to? Now I'm not assuming any facts because I've asked the proper questions in foundation or leading up to it. And the other one that comes up is just vague or another way of saying it is objection confusing. If your question that you're putting to a witness is just downright confusing, where you're not sure what the witness would answer because you're not even sure what the question calls for, say objection phase, vague or objection confusing because at least it can make um, uh, the proponent restate it. Those are the top five that I would think of. Leading, compound, asked and answers, assumes facts not in evidence, and vague. So here's my number one teaching point in this whole video as it relates to form objections. And it, it's, it's, it's something I've been teaching to law students for a long time. You can either get in a fight about an objection, any objection, a form objection or an evidentiary objection and have a full on argument and discussion before the court. Again, it could be the type of argument that's out in the open if, if allowed uh, in front of the jury, or it could be something where you go away to a separate room or a separate place in the courtroom and have what's called a sidebar when you have the discussion just with the judge. Um, and for a lot of these form objections, the ones we just talked about, the top five, it's simply not worth that fight. So you know, if you're on direct examination and you are the proponent, okay, what I want to talk about is the proponent is the one asking questions. So this trick, this number one is for the proponent and they get one of these form objections. Maybe it's the top five, it's leading or compound or asked and answered or assumes facts not in evidence or confusion or vague. Um, you're the proponent. Again, we're reacting like a professional. You're disengaging with your right hand where you're asking questions and getting answers from your witness on direct examination. You turn only the few degrees to face the court, not face the opponent who's talking and objecting to you. You give only the left ear hole to that other attorney. You engage with the court and you answer to the objections and a viable answer. And for my money, the best answer that you can offer on some, um, form objections and the ones we've discussed is just I'll rephrase. It shows command of the courtroom. It shows that you understand what the objection is and you can get back to it very easily. So I'll show you how we do that, do that with some of those top five. So again, let's just take, let's just take these top three. Okay. If it's a leading question and it's actually a problem. You're the proponent. You're asking questions on direct examination. You've asked a leading question and it happens all the time. Sometimes we furnish as the attorney, we furnish the information that we want our witness to come up with. And again, it's, uh, you live on Franklin Avenue or at the time in 2007, you lived on Franklin Avenue. Yes. The information is coming from the attorney. It's a leading question. And if your opponent thinks it's worthwhile. They're, they're doing their part. They're fulfilling their role and they stand up they address the court cl clear, uh, articulate an objection at a basis. And they say, your honor, 
objection leading, not overexcited, not pounding the table, not screaming like uh, TV in the movies, objection leading, Your Honor. Well, at that point, you can either respond and get in a whole discussion about this is leading, no, this isn't leading, I didn't mean it to be leading, I'm allowed to lead, so on and so forth, or you can simply say, I'll rephrase. And so imagine who the control that's projected in the courtroom when you say, you lived on Franklin Avenue, objection leading, Your Honor, I'll rephrase. At that time in 2007, where did you live? Franklin Avenue. For jurors, for neutral observers, they just saw someone control the situation. They saw someone move on through those hurdles without, with little to no interruption. And for real jurors in real trial, they look at it and say, why is that person objecting to a question like that when they know we're going to get the same answer uh, in a different form? So it's a way to take a form objection, use I'll rephrase and actually look better for it. It's the same thing with uh, objection compound, right? If my question is, uh, where'd you live in 2007 and where'd you move to next? Objection compound. Your Honor, I'll rephrase. Where'd you live in 2007 on Franklin Avenue? Next question. Where did you move to next? I moved across town to Smith Street, right? All I did was ask the same two questions and I broke it down, but I responded to the objection with I'll rephrase and I got back to my question one, question two, instead of having an argument, a nonsensical argument about whether the question is actually compound. Uh, and asked and answered, this is a tougher one, uh, but if you are asking and answering the same question, if I say, what, Detective Jones, what time did you get to the scene? 7.30, and then sometime later, um, I return to that question, I get objection, asked and answered, Your Honor, I'll rephrase. After you got to the scene at 7.30, what did you do first? Right? I, I took the answer that I already had, the answer that was the question that was already successfully answered, and I used it as an opening clause in my next sentence. So you can take uh, form objections, and I think the top five form objections, form objections I'm, I'm suggesting you make, and turn them into real opportunities as the proponent because you look good as the proponent, as the one on direct examination with one of your witnesses, asking clear who, what, when, why, how, describe, explain type questions of your witness, getting information before the jury. An objection comes, a form objection, like one of the ones we've discussed, and you're able to turn those little degrees, pivot to the judge, say, I'll rephrase, return to that other activity, ask a different question or move on seamlessly with the examination. You're projecting like a professional. You're projecting like a trial attorney, and that's the goal. That's what you want.